Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Arizona Foundation for Women's Financial Independence Seminars. Together with members of our Professional Advisors Committee, we bring you information from experts that can help you make critical financial decisions that affect you, your business, your family, and your community. At Arizona Foundation for Women, we work to advance the status of Arizona's women through research, advocacy, and philanthropy to ensure their safety, health, and economic independence. This year marks our 25th anniversary. Woohoo! Uh, although we have all been affected by an incredibly challenging year, you probably know that it's been especially tough on women. Between March and April of this year, the unemployment rate in Arizona grew from four and a half to five and a half percent in one month. 57% of all unemployment claims were female. They represent 48% of the workforce. In the U.S., mothers are 47% more likely to lose their job or quit, and 14% are more likely to be furloughed since the start of the crisis. Globally, 70% of healthcare workers and first responders are women, and therefore they're at a higher risk of exposure, while also bearing the majority of the childcare responsibilities. In Arizona, Phoenix's domestic violence shelters have reported a 50% drop in shelter capacity due to the COVID safety guidelines. But at the same time, the Phoenix police have reported an uptick in domestic violence crisis calls and a 140% increase in homicides related to domestic violence. AFW's work in research, advocacy, and programming is needed now more than ever. If you have clients or friends who are interested in helping Arizona's women, please feel free to reach out to me at Arizona Foundation for Women. My name is Jennifer Camano and I am Land Giving Director. I wanted to go over a couple of things really briefly on your console. You can make certain boxes bigger. There are uh, small triangular dots in the bottom right of the boxes and you can make those larger or smaller. Don't forget to also scroll left or right. Some of your boxes may open, but you might not see them because they're, they're over there or they're over there. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to welcome Kimberly Kerr and Justin Smith. Kimberly is a Senior Vice President for Planned Giving and Advancement at the Arizona Community Foundation. Both of their bios are attached if you'd like to uh, find out how to contact them or you know, get more background on either one of them. Because Arizona Foundation for Women is a supporting organization of the Arizona Community Foundation, I get the chance to work closely and learn from Kimberly. So I really appreciate her being here. Uh, she helps our board and sits on some of our committees. And Justin is a financial advisor with Savant Wealth Management. And they collaborate together more recently on financial seminars for uh, the public as well as industry professionals like today. This is for CE credit. Okay, so with that, I will talk to you guys in the Q&A and I welcome Justin and Kimberly. Thank you, Jennifer. So, um, all right, well, I'm just going to share a little bit about my background and then uh, Justin will as well, and then we'll get into it. Um, thank you. It's really um, a privilege to be able to partner with the Arizona Foundation for Women. I've been working with them for many years and um, just so appreciate the wonderful um, work they do and the impact they're able to make on the lives of women in our state. Um, so I am originally from Philadelphia and born and raised and educated there. I actually um, practiced law in Philadelphia for a few years before moving to Arizona almost 21 years ago. But um, at a young age, I knew that I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector. And when I practiced, I actually practiced in estate planning. When I moved to Arizona, I took the bar and then decided to actually look into a nonprofit career and learned about the Community Foundation and um, thought it was just the most perfect fit because I get to do all the fun parts of estate planning and get to work with our amazing nonprofit community and individuals, families, and businesses to help them carry out their charitable giving, both during lifetime and also creating charitable legacies through estate plans. And um, I do that a lot in partnership with 
our amazing professional advisory community being the charitable arm of the team of advisors. So I am so fortunate to get to work with you know, the donors, the nonprofits, and our professional advisors like Justin. And um, now I'll turn to Justin to introduce himself. Thanks, Kimberly. My name is Justin Smith, and I am a certified financial planner professional uh, and financial advisor with Savant Wealth Management. Um, one of the things I specialize in is helping people transition into retirement. And oftentimes that uh, integrates in with their philanthropic plan. Uh, and as I've progressed through my career, that philanthropic planning has been something I've been more and more focused on. And when I moved to Arizona, uh, the Arizona Community Foundation was one of the first places I connected with um, because I thought it was unique. I came from Chicago. Chicago did not have the same type of tight knit uh, philanthropic community that Phoenix has. So uh, I'm really excited to be connected with ACF and AFW today uh, because they just bring so much value to other professional advisors uh, like myself. And I think Kimberly wanted to talk a little bit about how those collaborative partnerships work. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, our CEO often says that our professional advisors are the unsung heroes of philanthropy. Um, you all have the that trusted advisor relationship with your clients, which gives you influence on how they may or think about chari incorporating charitable gift planning into their current plans and their planned gifts as well. And um, it's really, um, it really can differentiate you and add value you know, to the services you provide to clients and, and truly bring about a more meaningful result for them if uh, you can feel more comfortable in having conversations about charitable gift planning. Um, and then of course, using organizations like AFW and the Community Foundation and others to um, be your partner and the resource for philanthropy as well. And um, with that in mind, um, we, I'm a, a chartered advisor in philanthropy and Justin has passed all his exams for that and uh, just recently has participated in the CAP study group. So um, Justin, can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the CAP program, that Chartered Advisor of Philanthropy program, uh, is one that's offered through the American College. And the, the thing here in Phoenix is that uh, the Arizona Community Foundation and the Plan Giving Roundtable uh, collaborate to create a study group so that it's not just this virtual online learning. You actually have a group of local professionals going through the same educational process with you. And I found that incredibly valuable. Um, we're able to share different perspectives. Uh, you know, I'm coming from a financial planning and tax background where I'm getting to partner and collaborate with people who maybe have a grant writing background or a nonprofit leadership background or fundraising background. So we get to see different perspectives and it's been really valuable. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to have that uh, CAP designation conferred on me in the next couple of weeks here. And I believe there's a link or a flyer that you can download in the console here um, that talks more about the CAP program if you're interested. Great. Um, so I will just um, give a quick intro to what uh, we're gonna cover today. Um, we're uh, gonna get into some tax smart planning strategies uh, that we hope will be particularly helpful as we move into the year end uh, planning season um, that will include uh, bunching using donor advised funds, um, some unique opportunities for 2020 under the CARES Act, um, the qualified charitable distribution, um, and also some uh, additional opportunities created by the SECURE Act, and then some um, maybe some advanced uh, planning strategies at the end. We'll pause after each section in case you have questions or observations of, of that you want to share with the group. Um, and uh, we'll start with the first one. Uh, Justin, go ahead. Yep. So the first topic, and this becomes... Uh, always a very popular thing at the, the end of the year is bunching your donations together with a donor advised fund, shorthand that as DAF. Um, and the reason this is a really attractive strategy for donors is that 
many people are no longer itemizing their deductions. So there's a change from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which raised the standard deduction, meaning fewer people were itemizing, meaning fewer people were getting a tax deduction for their charitable um, contributions. That necess necessitates that you bunch together multiple years worth of contributions if you want to get a deduction. The downside to that bunching is that you lose control. You know, you get the deduction now, which is great, but you, you have to give it all up front. So the donor advised fund is a great solution there. Um, oftentimes what we see people do is say, I'm going to take five years worth of gifts and I'm going to make them all at once. So instead of giving $10,000 a year for five years, I'm going to give $50,000 right now. That ensures you will be able to itemize and go over the itemized threshold. You can get the deduction now, but you don't necessarily have to make the gifts all at once. You can spread them out over time by making distributions out of the donor advised fund. Another really attractive uh, feature of the donor advised fund is that you can fund it using appreciated securities. Uh, almost in all circumstances, I see people use appreciated securities rather than cash to fund their donor advised fund because it allows you to essentially remove unrealized gains from your investment portfolio. I see the lot, this a lot as people are maybe down risking their portfolio or they're rebalancing. Instead of selling it and realizing the gains, you can contribute those assets that are highly appreciated to your donor advised fund. Another advantage on top of that is that once the assets are in there, they're going to enjoy tax-free growth. So you can kind of carve out your charitable dollars. Those are going to grow tax-free for a number of years until you actually distribute them. So in a lot of circumstances, this is a really simple, effective alternative to a private foundation. You don't need to have that type of scale. Uh, this is much more uh, simple, yet very effective. And there are a, a host of well-known you know, national brands that have uh, products in this, the donor advised fund space, you know, Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, but ACF and other local nonprofit organizations have their own donor advised funds. And there are nuances and there are benefits to potentially partnering with a more local specialized boutique um, offering. And, you know, ACF is a great example of that. And Kimberly is going to talk more about specifically uh, what differentiates the ACF donor advised from, from some of those more national names. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as a community foundation, we customize our services for every donor. So just a few examples of um, the services that you would get with us um, where you may or may not get with other providers, um, depending, um, is, uh, is guidance to donors who want to be more strategic uh, with their uh, charitable giving. Um, we can help them develop, you know, focus areas, mission statements, um, ways of give, giving that may be more impactful. Um, sometimes they are really happy to be transactional and know exactly what they give to, want to give to, and that's great. But often they, they want to start thinking about and being more focused. We also offer a lot of um, multi-generational uh, philanthropic services and do like family retreats and things like that to bring um, the, the families together, especially when they're dispersed geographically. It's a, it's a great value add. We have that local statewide expertise because we are a statewide community foundation and have intimate knowledge of our nonprofit communities, you know, like wonderful organizations like AFW. So for example, if we have donors that want to address women's issues, then we'll be able to introduce them to AFW because we know that they are a tremendous resource in that area. Um, there's also all kinds of different funds that donors can create, um, both during lifetime, like we do a lot of scholarship funds. So it's not just donor advice funds. It's a way of helping families, individuals, businesses carry out whatever kind of, um, charitable giving they, they're looking to do as well as that creating those legacies through plan gifts. Um, and I, we also offer external asset management. So if you're uh, managing assets for your clients, um, you're recommending a donor advice fund to them, you can continue to manage the assets and the funds that they create both during lifetime and um, 
through your the plan gifts that they create. And we all know that the plan gifts are the gifts of assets and not just income. So those are, that's something that's really significant to keep in mind that you can help your clients carry out their legacy and also um, keep the assets on your books. I mean, it's great business and it's comforting to them to know that you would still be engaged even when they're no longer here. And as Justin talked about, I mean, a lot of our donors give um, appreciated stock, but we also can handle complex illiquid assets as well. So that's an, another important um, thing to keep in mind. And I'm happy to share, I'll share with you after this, we um, are sending out an e-alert today to professional advisors that has a real life donor story of a gift of business interests that we were able to accept recently uh, before they sold. And now they, it's been sold and all of that, um, those proceeds are now available for charitable giving and it helped the donor to, as Justin talked about, not be responsible for the, all the capital gain in that significant asset um, because we don't we don't pay uh, taxes. We're tax exempt. So um, I, uh, I I want to also point out, as I mentioned before, and this will come up a couple more times uh, today, um, that we do funds other than donor advised funds. So, for example. Um, in, if you wanted to bunch a gift to the Arizona Foundation for Women, um, you knew that you wanted to give them $5,000 for the next five years, um, you could actually put that all into a designated fund and then have that pay out you know, over the five years to them is another way of achieving that same goal uh, by bunching your charitable gifts um, in a single year. Um, that could also be an accelerated endowment fund uh, for the Arizona Foundation for Women, you know, or other organizations that you want to support in that way. Excellent. And then I wanted to, and we're going to do this throughout the presentation, is kind of take a take a, a peek forward towards how things might change in 2021. And we're still a couple of weeks from the election. We certainly don't want to get bogged down in any uh, political things today. But we do want to frame how some of these issues could change if some of the uh, the Biden tax proposals were to come into effect, because that is going to be make a decision making factor for high net worth donors, especially in these last two months of the year. And it's important to note that the Biden proposal uh, adds in a new capital gains rate of thirty nine point six percent, which is significantly higher than the 20 percent capital gains rate. So that would apply to gains over a million dollars a year. And there's also a proposal for the elimination of the cost basis step up at death. Both of those things make basically increase the tax burden on capital gains on a multi-generational perspective. And that being said, that's going to enhance the attractiveness and uh, the, the number of uh, people who might be interested in large scale uh, donor advised funds. And that also might play into people's timing if they are on the fence thinking about making a late 2020 gift to a donor advised fund. Uh, don't be surprised if people want to sit on the fence and wait to see how things shake out because that gift might have a significantly different tax value in 2021. Um, and back Staying in the kind of Washington realm, uh, Kimberly is going to give us an update on the CARES Act because there's some important uh, provisions inside, inside of that that uh, have a direct impact on philanthropy. Yes, yeah, so the CARES Act, as I'm sure you all know, was enacted on March 27th, uh, 2020, um, in response to the, the COVID um, economic crisis. And um, one of the things that uh, it did was allow a $300 above the line charitable deduction um, for contributions made to um, the qualified charitable contribution. That's what they called it. So it could only um, was available for gifts to public charities, um, but not including um, donor advised funds or supporting organizations. It also excluded um, most private foundations. Um, it's only available, and this is a, a 
it's three hundred dollars regardless of filing status. So for a couple, it's still three hundred dollars, and it's only for those who do not itemize. So it's a way for non-itemizers to still benefit from these small gifts that they make. Um, you know, for some people, that's that's it's significant. Um, so uh, the other thing is that um, that was sign really significant is that in the act, it actually doesn't say that it'll go away after 2020. So we're likely to see this continue. And I think that's just important to um, reinforce because we've never had an above the line charitable gift uh, tax deduction. So we've been lobbying for that for a long time and hopefully there will be a much more significant above the line deduction um, opportunity in the future. But right now, this is the $300. The other thing that the CARES Act um, provided, well, the, for, for corporations for just 2020, they increased the, um, the, 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 the limit to the deductibility of your AGI from 10% to 25%. And for individuals, they increased the deductibility of cash contributions to um, these qualified charitable contributions that we just uh, talked about. So only to public charities, but not donor advice funds or support orgs. Cash contributions um, could be deducted up to 100% of your AGI. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act had increased that uh, limit to 60% of your AGI. It had been 50% from as long as I could remember. So um, as of the uh, 2018, it was um, 60%. But for 2020 only, that limit is now 100%. So no limit <laughs> to your AGI for cash contributions that you can deduct. So, um, you know, it's been interesting to think about how your clients, um, our donors, could benefit from this because, um, you know, as Justin talked about, and we've seen the market increase in appreciated, you know, marketable securities, you know, often it's still going to be more beneficial for your clients to donate, you know, appreciated stock and not have to be liable for the capital gain tax on that appreciation. But there's a, a few scenarios where this could be um, a useful planning strategy, and Justin's going to share some of those. Yeah, and I'm not anticipating that I'm going to see too many people uh, you don't, bumping up against that 100% of AGI limitation this year, but there are certainly some situations where that might uh, come about. Um, somebody who is doing a significant Roth IRA conversion, that might uh, be an interesting strategy or if you have a large asset sale, uh, somebody can donate cash in connection with that to offset the or their ordinary income. Uh, and another thing that's important to note here is that that 100% of AGI uh, deduction doesn't work if the dollars go to a donor advised fund, but we do have a simple workaround, which is where we can use a designated fund uh, that can go to someplace like AFW uh, and it just had to have a little bit more structure than it would in a donor advised fund. And then one last thing on the CARES Act, it did remove uh, the requirement for people age 72 and above to take distributions from their retirement accounts. We're gonna talk more about that issue in our QCD section, but there's gonna be some implications there from the CARES Act as well. But the next section we wanted to focus on was uh, the Arizona tax credits, specifically, the dollar for dollar credits that you get for contributions made to certain charitable organizations here in Arizona. And you know, I'm relatively new to the state. And when I first came here, I honestly didn't believe it. Uh, but being the tax nerd that I am, I went to the Department of Revenue, read uh, 321 and 301, read all the forms, and it absolutely is true. And it works and it is uh, as simple as that as a dollar for dollar credit. You give $1 to one of these supporting organizations and it directly reduces your tax bill or increases your refund by that same dollar. And there's actually a handful of different programs. Uh, the first one is for qualifying charitable organizations. Uh, the maximum you can get a credit for on these is $800 for a married couple, 400 uh, for a single. There are, I believe, over 
1,100 different organizations that qualify for this. So the best place to go is the Arizona Department of Revenue website where they have the official list of all the qualifying charitable organizations inside of that program. At that same location, you'll be able to see the list of qualifying foster care organizations. This credit is either $1,000 or $500, depending on filing status. There's only 45 organizations that are in that category. Then there's also a pair of private school tuition programs, which could be as much as $2,365 for a married couple, $1,183 uh, single. And there's also a smaller program for public, uh, public school fees. And again, I encourage you to go look at the Arizona uh, Department of Revenue website to look at those lists and just see if it, it sparks anything. Maybe there's already an organization that you're donating to on those lists. Um, there's a lot of um, familiar names on those lists. And I think it's really, you know, the state does not report on a macro level the utilization of these programs. Uh, but estimates are that less than 1% of taxpayers are actually utilizing these programs. So there's an absolutely massive amount of opportunity um, for professional advisors and nonprofits to expand education and utilization of these programs. And when you're thinking about AFW, you can go through those lists and you'll find that probably a lot of them align with the AFW mission of safety, health, and economic empowerment. So I encourage you to, to do your research and we won't get into the nitty gritty of how you actually file those, but most people in that situation have a tax preparer who will be uh, very capable of filling out the, uh, the simple credit worksheets on your Arizona tax return. And I was going to hand it to Kimberly to talk more about some of the nuance and best practices uh, around those tax credits. Thank you. So tax credits, you know, allow taxpayers to direct their tax dollars to where, you know, they want them to go. And it's a really, uh, you know, a great thing from that perspective. Um, but some of the things that, you know, there are some abuses with, the, the way these tax credits are being carried out. And so just a couple of maybe um, some best practices to keep in mind and share with clients who might be open to trying to um, serve, uh, you know, where there would be the most need in the community. So um, for the public school extracurricular tax credits, our public schools, especially in our higher income communities, have gotten really savvy to this and solicit these contributions, you know, from from their the parents of their students, and um, and often it's for their own kids, you know, extracurricular activities, and you know that's nice for the individual, but it's not really doing, I think, what was intended by by the tax credit. So I would encourage you, if you have clients that are open to it, to um, thinking about sending um, those tax credit contributions for public school extracurriculars to schools where um, maybe they're Title I schools, uh, you know, where the, there really isn't a, a financial need on part of the students and they wouldn't have the same kinds of, you know, financial resources that other schools have. Um, another thing for the school tuition organization um, tax credit, um, that's a space that our Arizona Community Foundation actually worked in for about five or so years. We actually developed an STO to try to, um, you know, be a model for a best practice because a lot of those um, STOs are part of a specific private school and there's opportunity for abuses where um, family members might contribute and have it go to like their own, you know, friends or whatever um, tuition. <laughs> so if you're, if you're looking to try to make it, um, you know, more equitable and serving uh, students with more need, consider um, STOs that are not connected to a specific school um, or that at least run a blind-based needs process. And if you have any questions or want more information on, on these kinds of best practices, we, we'd be happy to share. Um, you know, we can also be a resource if uh, you have clients that are looking for, you know, qualifying charitable organizations um, that are supporting, you know, really low income and you know, uh, supporting people of color and, and doing things in a in a more um, equitable way. And I'm sure AFW would do the same. They grant to other organizations, 
specifically in the areas of safety, health, and economic empowerment for women. And, um, you know, they could also share a list of grantees that would be qualifying charitable organizations um, for that tax credit. Oh, I share one more thing. Thank you. <laughs> so um, the one other uh, thing to keep in mind, and some of you are, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but it's just, um, I think, helpful to point out the sort of the history and the evolution. So for, for many years, um, a lot of Arizona donors were able to take the tax credit and also a federal income tax charitable deduction. So it was kind of a, a double benefit. Um, when uh, there was the, the whole review of um, enacting the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, this kind of came to light. Um, and, uh, and as a result, uh, the IRS put a stop to that. So as of September of 2018, um, you, if you're taking a dollar for dollar tax credit, your clients cannot also, you know, claim a federal income tax charitable deduction um, and get and come actually come out ahead. So um, even regardless of that limitation, as Justin pointed out at the outset, it is a dollar for dollar tax credit. <laughs> like there really is no better deal in in town. So um, it's an important thing to be aware of and and happy to be a resource. Yep, absolutely. No double dipping, but it's still a, a great program. And the next topic we were going to focus on is the qualified charitable distribution. So this is a relatively new um, provision that was made permanent just a couple of years ago in the tax code where people who are over the age of 72, um, those folks have a required minimum distribution out of their retirement accounts every year. And from my experience, affluent individuals, this is a pain point for them because they're essentially forced to take unneeded taxable income. Um, so what the QCD allows them to do is instead of receiving that required distribution as taxable income, they can give it directly to a charity. And after we had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, this became even more attractive, again, because people are not itemizing it as much. So this has become a really widely used tool um, from five or 10 years ago, literally with this wasn't even a thing. And now it's become very, very popular. Again, uh, the CARES Act uh, eliminated the requirement for RMDs out of retirement accounts in 2020. So you're probably not going to be seeing as many in 2020, but I would anticipate it's going to pick up uh, back in 2021. And again, you don't need to itemize. You actually get the same or better tax benefits versus on Schedule A uh, for your higher end, higher earning, uh, higher bracket individuals. In addition to getting the uh, deduction for the QCD, it can also do some other things. It can reduce the net income or net investment income surtax, also called the Medicare surtax. And it also can reduce Medicare premiums as well, because those both are based on your total AGI. And the QCD is a page one um, deduction of your income. So that directly reduces AGI and reduces some of those other surtaxes. And there are some important planning considerations here. Again, this must go directly to charity. This cannot go to your donor advised fund. Um, and another thing that's important to note is that there's not at the moment an official channel to, for this to be reported on the 1099-R tax document. So oftentimes what I'm seeing is that somebody will hand their documents to their tax preparer, but they won't have the supporting documentation from the charity that tells their tax preparer, I made a QCD, so reduce my income. So I think this is very important for professional advisors and nonprofits alike to make sure that we're documenting these QCDs very well so that when it comes to tax time, it's very clear that this portion or the entirety of the QCD should not be included in income. And uh, just to give you a little idea of the scope, this can be as much as $100,000 per year per individual, so $200,000 per couple. And although it was waived in 2020, uh, it still might be a viable option for uh, certain folks. And, you know, I mentioned that this can't go to a donor advised fund, Kimberly, but what are some of the other things 
that people might be able to do uh, that's different than just direct to a public charity. Yes, absolutely. Um, so if, uh, especially for donors that are looking to do um, larger amounts, so as Justin pointed out, it's up to $100,000 for an individual each year. And that is regardless of the amount of the RMD. So, you know, if your RMD is just a couple thousand dollars, but you have clients that are actually wanting to spend down their IRA or just excited, they were going to leave it to charity anyway. So they want to accelerate their planned gift and be able to see the fruits of their, their giving while they're still alive. It's just, um, you know, a tremendous opportunity if they are looking to either spend it down for state tax reasons or um, just don't want the income, don't need the income, are charitably minded. You know, as Justin said, if they're taking the standard deduction, they could use their IRAs like their donor advice fund, right? And some um, financial institutions that, you know, are holding the IRA accounts are providing checkbooks for the IRA holders so they can actually write checks out to um, their the charity. So it's a, it's a really important opportunity for all nonprofits to keep in mind. For, um, for AFW, we mentioned earlier, um, Jennifer shared, there we have this really wonderful special partnership with them and they're actually formed as a supporting organization. Um, so the QCDs cannot go to them directly, but we can set up um, and you know have worked out arrangement where um, there are donors, any one of your clients that are interested in supporting them with a QCD can, can actually contribute to a designated fund for AFW benefit. And that could be any amount. Um, but if you have clients that are looking to do the much larger amounts, it's 25,000 as a minimum to create a separate named fund. So if you have clients that um, are looking to do larger amounts, but don't necessarily want to give that large an amount to um, an organization in one year, they can use a designated fund, as I said before, to have it um, be spent down over X number of years, uh, or and or they can do a larger amount to create an endowment for um, the AFW or uh, and or other causes that they care about. Um, just a one point two, just to make it really clear, for a couple to do the two hundred thousand dollars, each spouse needs to be seventy and a half and have their own IRA to be able to, to benefit from that. But if that's the case, you know, we're talking about, you know, significant dollars on an annual basis. So it's a really important opportunity. And I'll just underscore too what Justin said. Anecdotally, what I've been hearing is that they, these have continued throughout 2020, even in spite of the fact that um, the CARES Act halted the RMD requirement for 2020. So um, as far, most people that have been doing that, the QCD, are still doing it in 2020. So um, it's still an important thing to keep in mind and, uh, and try to plan for um, before you get close to the end of December because it is important that those um, distributions are received by the organization in this calendar year. So um, please plan ahead. And the, oh, you know what, we promise, and I'm so sorry, because I actually said at the beginning that we would pause and we didn't quite pause. So let's pause here before we get into the SECURE Act and our ending topics um, to see if there are questions and or observations from anyone. Um, we'd love to hear from you. I don't have anything just yet. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so Justin, take it away. Secure Act, or is this me? Yeah, so we're gonna talk about the Secure Act next and the impacts that that had. So that was enacted uh, in 2019. It was a nearly unanimous decision. It started on 1-1-2020. Um, it sometimes gets forgotten about because shortly, you know, three months later, the CARES Act came into place. But the SECURE Act was one of the largest changes to the way retirement accounts are treated uh, in, in decades. So it did a couple of things that are really important from a planning perspective. It increased the age for required minimum distributions from 70 and a half to 72. 
It also repealed the maximum age for people to make traditional IRA contributions. Um, previously, once you hit 70 and a half, you could not put anything else into your traditional IRA. That cap has now been lifted. And what I think is the biggest thing is that it eliminated what is oftentimes called the stretch IRA distributions provision for IRAs that are inherited uh, by non-spouse beneficiaries. So non -spouse, or spouses can still stretch a beneficiary IRA over their lifetime, but now children, relatives, other people who inherit the IRAs are gonna be forced to take distributions from those inherited IRAs over a much shorter window. Instead of taking over your life expectancy, maybe 30, 40, 50 plus years, that distribution, that entire inherited IRA needs to be taken out within a 10 year window. Um, from the beneficiary perspective, that means they're likely going to be pushed up into higher tax brackets because they're gonna be having to recognize more income. And this is gonna be presenting a significant opportunity for charitable planning because essentially the tax burden on retirement assets got larger. And many times the tax burden goes up, the charitable opportunity goes up with that. Um, and the way I'm seeing it now is that retirement accounts are kind of moving up the hierarchy of the first bucket we look to to fund charitable giving. People might have retirement accounts. They might have taxable accounts. They might have Roth IRA accounts. Uh, in most circumstances, that retirement account bucket is the first one we look to to fund uh, substantial charitable giving because of the changes I just mentioned, because uh, there's the largest tax burden there. And Kimberly's going to talk about some of the more uh, advanced strategies that we're seeing that are stemming from those Secure Act changes, particularly uh, charitable remainder trusts, which can be used to kind of replicate some of the uh, stretch IRA um, qualities and also charitable gift annuities. So I will hand it back to Kimberly. Thank you. So it, Justin said it exactly right. Um, and we're, we're starting to see it. Um, certainly when the SECURE Act um, first came to be, you know, the very end of December, it was a nearly unanimous uh, decision of all branches of government and, uh, well, I guess the Supreme Court didn't weigh in, but <laughs> between the legislature and executive, and it was um, almost like record timing from, you know, vote to president signing and then became effective. So this is, uh, we believe this is definitely here to stay. And, um, you know, there was a, there's a lot of planning opportunities that don't have anything to do with charity necessarily, but there was uh, in the charitable world, tremendous speculation about how the testamentary CRT and the CGA charitable gift annuity would become um, a really important um, planning strategy to use for, for clients. This, you know, for the 20 years that I've been in this uh, field, um, we've been talking up testamentary CRTs using retirement assets for, you know, till we're blue in the face, but for some reason we don't see a lot of them because the retirement assets are always this high tax burden for non-spousal heirs. You know, um, the stretch IRA, you know, helps to stretch that tax burden over the lifetime. Of course, now there's no stretch. So, but it was still, you know, a tax burden and a really important asset to think about for charity and leave other assets to heirs. But now with the elimination of the stretch, tremendous opportunities. So with um, these two options, so the charitable remainder trust is where um, the the actual um, IRA assets would, the beneficiary designation would be the CRT or the organization that is um, sponsoring the charitable gift annuity. So that in either case, they would have to change the beneficiary designation so that at the passing of um, the IRA holder, the assets in the IRA would be fully distributed to the newly created charitable remainder trust or the organization to set up the charitable gift annuity. And in both cases with a CRT or a CGA, then it would create an opportunity for lifetime income to uh, this non-spousal uh, beneficiary 
that, you know, they could get income for life where they couldn't get it with the 10 year limitation um, on the stretch opportunity. So with the CRT, it could actually be term of years up to 20 years or lifetime, whatever the IRA, um, you know, the, the donor actually wants to do. Um, the, the CRT should be drafted during lifetime, but wouldn't actually be come into being until they pass. And they, they determine the payout percentage. They determine who the charitable beneficiaries will be once the income beneficiaries pass. So it's in, the CRT means that the remainder goes to charity, income to non-charitable beneficiaries, typically for a lifetime. The charitable gift annuity can be for up to two annuitants. And by the way, the CRT can be, um, I think it's limited to eight income beneficiaries, but it's uh, not limited to two. So lots, lots of income beneficiaries can be named. The HCGA is up to two annuitants, um, and it's definitely only for a lifetime. They don't have a term of years option. But, um, but this, it's a simple contract with a charity that sponsors ch charitable gift annuities. ACF does offer this, but it could be on behalf of, um, and the same with the CRT, the remainder can come to the community foundation or direct can go directly to AFW either way. But in any case, it could um, then designate specific organizations like AFW. So um, lots of opportunities to customize a legacy. Um, but since we are here for AFW today, we'll assume that um, we're talking about a way to create a charitable legacy um, for your clients to benefit AFW and also stretch the um, the income. The one other thing to note is that the um, the income received from the CRT or from the charitable gift annuity would be taxable to the income beneficiaries, but it would be spread over the lifetime. So if they were when it used to be um, the stretch for lifetime, it would also be taxable. So it's the same. The, in, the income tax um, to them is the same, but um, gives you that stretch opportunity. Um, anything else on that, Justin? Yeah, I think it's just important to, to reiterate that between the you know, the deficits that the country has and the likely tax increases that are on the horizon, you know, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is has a sunset provision inside of it. So we already know there's at least one tax increase on the horizon, and there's likely to be more as well, plus this new rule about a 10-year distribution window. That, that is essentially making retirement assets less valuable on an after-tax basis, which makes them prime charitable candidates. Um, we're seeing, I think we're going to see more and more of this, is that wealthy individuals are going to be opting to spend down their retirement assets and utilize their retirement assets either during their lifetime via QCDs and charitable gift annuities or at death with uh, charitable remainder trusts um, or just outright beneficiary designation. And another thing I uh, can really talk about and we talked about in the QCD section is that you can essentially just start turning retirement accounts into a charitable checkbook, which I think is a really interesting concept is that somebody could carve that out uh, maybe some or all of their retirement accounts, and they could be writing checks via QCDs, and they could be designated to go to the charity of their choice at their passing. Um, so it's like a, a, a streamlined mini, mini virtual endowment as well. So I think it's a really cool concept that uh, definitely warrants further exploration for our clients. Um, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, we will make sure we carve out enough time for any questions that pop in. Um, Kimberly, Kimberly and I can talk uh, indefinitely if there's anything else that comes up. But uh, Jennifer, do we have any questions come in? Yes, we do. We have a question okay. from Chris Fraker. Hi, Chris. I'm with Chris um, at U of A. In the case of a testamentary CRT or CGA, what kind of contingency language would you suggest incorporating into the trust documents or the CGA contract? For example, highest payout rate per ACGA, assuming income recipients are still alive. 
Um, so for the CGA, you know, the best practice is to follow the rates that are set by the American Council on Gift Annuities. So that the the, the annuity rate would be determined um, at the time based on the ages of the annuitants. So that that should be just stated that they'll follow the ACGA rates um, at that time. For the CRT, it, it has to be at least uh, five percent of um, the payout rate, and um, you know I think a best practice is to to not go too high, too much higher than that, um, because assuming it's a, a unit trust, um, you know you want to be able to have the investments um, work and help to grow the assets. So if the payout rate is too high, then it would start to invade the principal and make it. You know, then the actual income would go down, the remainder of charity would go down. So you want to be careful about that. Um, but it's important to talk to people like Justin and get advice on on the payout rate. Um, what is there an, a follow up question on that? Did, is that helpful, Chris? I I think the question was answered. I don't see a dialogue box. For our folks out there, but no other right. question has come up. Yeah, so I think just... another important. Okay, oh, is there something else? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to add on what you said about the the CRT payout rate. Is that that's something that's important to test because a higher payout rate does not necessarily mean higher lifetime payout. As as kind of counterintuitive as that sounds, because as you alluded, if you set the payout rate at 10 percent, you could quickly exhaust the entire trust. There's nothing left for the income beneficiaries. There's nothing left for the charity. So um, usually skewing towards the low end can actually be a larger net benefit for all parties involved. But it's very important that you test it out uh, in, you know, with sophisticated modeling for the specific circumstance you're dealing with. So there was a follow-up um, that... <laughs> Chris says um, he meant that question to be compared to a CRUT created during your lifetime. So, um, okay. Well, so the only, the difference is that the donor doesn't know when, when this is going to come into being. So, um, you know, I guess we just have to talk it, talk it through, but I, I, I'm not sure what to say without a specific question on the comparison. Um, I mean, it, it will work the same way, um, and it is the, up to the donor the, who's uh, creating this with their IRA um, to set the payout rate, um, to name the you know remainder beneficiaries, um, name the trustee. So we we can talk through all that, but in purposes of the beneficiary designation, it would be naming the actual CRT. Or for the gift annuity, it would be naming the organization, you know, with instructions to create a CRT. The um, oftentimes there's limited space on a beneficiary designation form, so you know we can certainly provide guidance depending on the specifics. Is that helpful? He says, "Okay, thanks." <laughs> I think so. Terrific. All right. Well, I know we're um, close to um, time, and we certainly welcome any additional questions. So please send them in. Um, the uh, I'll just mention that one of the attachments that you'll find in somewhere here, <laughs> and also will follow in an email, is a um, a chart that compares various plan giving vehicles. And um, so hopefully that's a helpful reference um, and for you. And um, and then, you know, CRTs during lifetime right now are, you know, they're important to keep in mind because if you have appreciated assets that you're thinking of selling and you are looking to generate additional income, that it could be a really great planning uh, tool to keep in mind. But one of the reasons they're not as popular, especially right now, is because the um, the applicable federal rate interest rates generally and the, the 7520 rate that is used to calculate the deduction for um, CRTs uh, is so low that it actually um, is a disincentive um, in terms of the, the tax deduction that you'll be able to get. Uh, the converse makes it so that the charitable lead trust 
is a really in, important um, opportunity to keep in mind with the, the rates so low. And Justin's going to explain that. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to tackle with, with just a handful of minutes left, but it's definitely something worth exploring. And just, you know, it's always important to remember that there are multiple flavors of uh, charitable lead trusts. We have the grantor style, which is primarily for income tax planning. Um, and usually it comes back to the grantor. You can also have the non-grantor one, which is more of a transfer vehicle. Uh, both of them will benefit a charity for a period of years, and then it either swings back around to the grantor or passes on transfer tax free to uh, other beneficiaries. And there's also um, the super lead trust, which is a, a little bit more cutting edge where you can kind of find some hybrid opportunities to get the best of both worlds. But we don't have much time to dive into that because that's a whole other webinar. So I don't know if you said this, Justin, I don't think I did, but the other attachment that you'll find, there's three. Um, the other one is the QCD info sheet, oh, this right. uh, reference for that. Um, Jennifer, are you seeing any other questions? Not at this time. And that was a whole bunch of information. My brain is swimming. Um, <laughs> so I, I am wondering, and I don't know that we have the uh, capacity to do this, but I'm wondering what people are seeing. Can you, either one of you, talk about what you've seen in the industry um, lately? Well, I'm seeing right now is that a lot of people are kind of, are waiting on, on the big ticket planning because of the election. Uh, because like we talked about, there's some really key changes that could potentially uh, stem from changes in Washington. Things like I mentioned before, the cost basis step up at death being eliminated, that would have radical implications for charitable planning. Uh, if the estate tax exemption goes down, you know, the, the sunset gets accelerated or it goes down even further, this larger capital gains rate, basically if some or all of the Biden proposal uh, gets implemented, it's going to make this charitable planning all the more critical. So I'm curious um, to hear from you too, Kimberly, but I also want to know what, um, there are a couple people from charities on the line, and what should we be doing? What should we be promoting? Well, I was going to say that what we've seen and heard that the estate planning attorneys are slammed. Um, there are clients who you know, didn't sign their documents from years ago, planning or or just coming to them to update are just pounding on their doors now to uh, to update or put plans in place. So it, it creates an, a tremendous opportunity for you know AFW, U of A, other other nonprofits to steward your donors, you know, like you have never before, right? They 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 need to know that you're here for them and, and to understand the impact of your work and for you to, you know, make sure they're keeping you in mind for their charitable legacy. So if you were in their plans before or not yet in their plans, that they will include you in their plans since they're working on them now. So I just can't say enough about the plan giving opportunities and not just because, you know, you might find donors in a, in a more wait and see um, situation on the current lifetime giving, but, but also because, as I said before, the plan gifts are the big gifts. That's how you're gonna grow your endowment. That's how you're gonna um, really, you know, be, make an impact on your future sustainability because those are gifts of assets. Um, I am also seeing, and I will say, and it's just, you know, so comforting, that we tripled, I believe, I, I can get you statistics, but the amount of grants that went out from our donor advised funds in, you know, during this, this whole time has been like exponentially above what it was the year before. So even though the asset values might have gone down with the drop in March, donors were giving like, you know, they, they, you know, they understand the need. So, um, that was really comforting, and I, I know it's still 
it's still really hard because it still only scratches the surface of what the need is. So, um, but uh, but stay stay close to your donors. Any other questions? No, not at this time. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, both of you joining us today, and um, thank you everyone else who joined. And we're right about at time. I don't know if it boots us off or not, but uh, steward those donors. Got that loud and clear. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.